So we're really happy to have Edward today from uh, QuasarDB. QuasarDB is another financial uh, fin financial time series database that's sort of focusing on uh, ticks coming from stock markets and tra trading uh, installations. So we're really happy to have Edward here and, and go for it. Okay, so I'm Edward Ligon, I'm the founder and CEO of the company. Um, so it's going to be a very technical presentation, I hope. If you have any question, you can ask me at any point in time and I will answer to the best of my capabilities. Um, before I go into the details, uh, the goal of this presentation is to discuss about what you have to do to make your software go fast in this context being a database. Because the use case we have is there's really a lot of data coming on nonstop and you don't have the liberty to be unreliable because you have to also be reliable with your updates. So there's the contradiction about being precise, being accurate and being fast. Um, before we start, uh, let's have a discussion about benchmarks. Because uh, if there is only one takeaway, uh, it's about having a critical mind about benchmarks and the way you approach how to evaluate the speed of software or any kind of software in general. So in terms of database, let's, let's have a, a different context uh, in usage. Uh, let's go away from database and let's talk about cars, right? So if I give you two cars just for the appearance like this, and I ask you which one is the fastest, and let's assume you don't know anything about cars, just look at it. I think most of you maybe would say the Porsche is faster, right? No one, no one has an ID, no one cares? <laughs> We've seen the YouTube video, we know the Tesla is faster. Actually, it's faster for the, on a stop like this, yes, it's faster. Because it's an electric engine with immediate torque compared to explosive engine with torque only in the revs up. But the true story is actually the Porsche is significantly faster than the, the Tesla. If you go to the number ring, actually the Tesla cannot finish the lap with full power because it overheats, kind of stuff. Uh, so it's always interesting to have a company, I'm the CEO of a company, uh, I will show, I try to show up and uh, give you numbers and say, well, my database is faster, but you should always be critical and see, because what you don't see here is the weight of the car, the capability to handling the turns and the kind of stuff. And for database, it's exactly the same thing. I can show you numbers where I show, hey, I can aggregate billions of lines per second. What does it mean for you? If, for example, you're a trading firm and you want to uh, compute the weighted averages of uh, your stocks, that's what you care about. And uh, if you do analytics, if you want to do monitoring, you care about being able to uh, ingress everything you have. So in the field of database, uh, for one customer, uh, we did a benchmark, uh, pure read-write benchmarks using the low-level API where we write blobs uh, to the disk and read blobs to the disk. Uh, the setup is on the left, and uh, so it's bounded to by 10 gigabytes. And as you can see, the open source NoSQL, and just name, not naming it because I'm not interested in bashing on anyone, uh, writes t more than twice, almost three times faster than us. Uh, so the conclusion could be, well, we suck. Yeah, maybe. Uh, so, but there's just this little detail that they write faster than the disk. Uh, and so the conclusion is uh, when you see numbers like this, uh, what you actually are reading is that they don't really write to disk immediately. They buffer in memory and then write to disk, which is fine in general. And not saying one of the other two databases is better, but in your context, that may be a huge problem because your data may be arriving all the time. And at some point, what's in memory has to be written to the disk, right? So what I just want to say to start this talk is uh, just don't read too much in benchmark because uh, you can craft the benchmark you need. You can make the modifications you want in the database to pass a benchmark with flying colors. And what you really care uh, if at some point you are going to evaluate a product, whether it's a database or another product, is to make sure that you go beyond the marketing and you really understand what's going on and be a critical mind. Okay, so very quickly now we're talking about what we do, what the database comes from, like in a couple of minutes, and then we get really into the details of what we did uh, to have the performance we can deliver. So basically, like uh, it was said, Andy said, uh, we were born in market finance. Uh, to be precise, uh, the idea appeared during the financial crisis in 2008. Uh, when I decided to change my career and I say, well, I'm going to work in market finance 
and I picked the best year for it, 2008. So don't know if you remember it, but it's basically market crashes. Um, it, Quasar is a time series database. Um, whatever that means, we see later that what's the definition of time series. Uh, Market finance time series is really a great way to represent what's going on in the markets because you're really interested in two things. That's the value of uh, whatever stocks you're looking at. Or it's in this case, it's the cross. It's a USD euro stock cross um, and uh, the value and then maybe other instruments. So time series are great because then you can ask questions such as, can you give me the values between two points in time or can you compute some sort of aggregation like uh, I want the average value or maybe I want the median or maybe I want the standard deviation, that kind of stuff. And in a time series database like us, which is column oriented, uh, we get more into the data exactly what the software is, it's very easy to do and very fast. Uh, just to be clear, below a certain amount of data, any kind of database is fine uh, for your workload. And, uh, Really, if you, the amount of data is reasonable, uh, you should probably first try a generic database, I don't know, like, like PostgreSQL, uh, because it's probably going to be able to handle your workload. What happens is when you either have a lot of data or you have a lot of requests, then you should start considering, well, maybe I need something a little bit more specific. Um, in finance, the amount of data you can get is really insane. And there are two insanity, uh, if you will make the word, is first, the amount of data is crazy. So that's, uh, yeah, 10 million messages per second, the whole day from nine to five, just for a couple of stocks, exchanges, and you have probably more data to get. And one message is obviously not one point. Um, the lot of activities when people do what we call uh, bid and ask is, uh, hey, how much would you be willing to pay for my stock? Or, hey, I have stock, how much uh, uh, I would like uh, this to sell this amount of data. So it's really a lot of data. And the other problem is you have to be very accurate that you cannot uh, cut corners in the sense that um, if you want to get a lot of performance uh, and you can forego a little bit of reliability, then what you can do is, like we saw uh, a little bit earlier, for example, you can buffer rights to disk and it's fine if the, the computer crashes and you lose a little bit of data. Uh, you can allow to be non-consistent if you have a distributed database. Okay, so this value is not exactly what I expected, but it's fine because in my context, I don't care. For example, if you display an ad on a website and you display the wrong ad, it's, it's fine, right? But if you do a deal with the wrong value, it can have financial consequences. So that's also things you're going to find uh, in other areas, such as uh, predictive maintenance, where you really want to have uh, accurate values. Um, so again, I, I go back to the story of uh, when I have all this data, and uh, then let's say you want to, your job is you're working at a hedge fund or investment bank and uh, your job is to uh, make sense of all this market data and to build the infrastructure. So you have to be naive in the way you approach problems. Um, like you don't have, you should not have an opinion about what you should do before you really study the question. Like uh, what kind of data do I have? So in this case, it's obviously time series. Um, how much data do I have per day? And you know, like if you get caught in, well, it's millions. Yeah, but one million points is uh, just a megabyte. Uh, what level of reliability do I need? So if your bank, uh, there's new regulation coming up, for example, and you have to keep the data for seven years and you have to be able to answer questions to our regulatory entities, we will be very happy to find a reason to find you. So um, that kind of stuff. But maybe if you're in different businesses, I just need to keep one year of data, or it's just for my own statistical need that I have a historical of data. So I'm, how much money am I going to spend on my system, right? Um, then just to give you, so I'm not going to give you a crash course on uh, market finance. Maybe some of you don't really care about market finance in general, but just a couple of questions, uh, things, problems we solve for the customer we have. Uh, we have three kinds of customers, uh, stock exchanges, investment banks, and the hedge funds, so pretty focused, right? Um, 
So it's really, they usually have a lot of data and they found a solution for the data of the day. Like, I can ask any question about my data of today because it's a reasonable amount of data, it fits in memory and that's fine. Um, but if I'm an analyst, I'm really interested in what was going on 10 years ago about that stock because maybe I'm going to find patterns, maybe I'm going to get IDs. Uh, maybe I'm going to find correlations. Sometimes correlations can be very weird. Like you can find that two companies that do totally different things actually have the stocks correlated. And maybe you can are willing to bet on this. Um, so what we come up with is a solution that they can store everything they want and ask a couple of questions in real time the database. Uh, we're now the only one to do that in the market. Uh, you had a lecture from a, a company that's doing a similar things. So the product is a bit different in the sense that our solution is scale out and uh, we solve a kind of <laughs> a very difficult problem of uh, distributed transactions <laughs> and that kind of stuff. But the thing is now we have a scale out database and we can ingest a lot of data and we also have uh, what we done when we designed the stuff is really to go back to the problem and interface with the tools people have. For example, uh, machine learning with it, which is emerging. Uh, we have connectors for Apache Spark, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's really about delivering a lot of data in real time. And just so, yeah, it's the end of uh, what we do really quickly. Um, and that's the kind of performance we deliver with just one thread. Uh, that sounds maybe like a lot, but it's requirement, for example. Uh, we had one customer, one of the oldest we had, they say, okay, uh, I need to do 8 million updates per second in your database and do that reliably, can you do it? And if you don't do it, we don't have a deal. So currently, uh, yeah, we can aggregate at 1 billion lines per second when it's in memory and uh, ing ingress at millions of points per second. But again, that looks impressive because I'm doing marketing here, right? But just multiply that by the size of double and you see it's not that much in terms of megabytes. Uh, you machines, they can handle gigabytes of sec per second. Anyway. Yeah. So like, looking at some of those numbers, what are your bottlenecks? Are you memory bandwidth limited? Are you um, limited? Are you Repeat the question. Oh, so uh, the question is, is currently what is our bottleneck? So uh, today I would say it's a persistent layer, uh, I think. Because with 100 gigabit, you generally are faster than the persistent layer. So we get around that by distribution, uh, by clustering. Like, uh, actually, we work with Intel and, the, and a company named Levix for persistence. Uh, and we are uh, very eager to test the new opt-in technology. Um, but I would say that's, that's really persistence. Uh, then. For certain kind of aggregations, well, when we memory bound, I think it's a success. It's a really mean we've done our job really well. Uh, at some point, it's a software. The data structure, the computation indexes. Uh, yeah, it's interesting because uh, today, network is no longer really a bottleneck in terms of bandwidth. Maybe in latency, uh, but we see that later. For latency, what we've done is we worked with companies like Melanox to bring down latency as much as we can. In this case, there are two shortcuts we have. Um, actually, now uh, we write directly to the storage. But um, the first thing is, instead of uh, when I get uh, data from the network, reading, letting the system copy that in the buffer and then read the buffer and then read it again and again and again, and maybe my own software is making copies, we go to the network card and just read the data in place. So it saves you a lot of copy and gains a lot of latency. And uh, the other thing is uh, modern network cards are also able to offload a little bit of computation required for uh, TCP IP connections um, protocol. And for the storage, it's the same thing. If your database, uh, you can either rely on the file system that is, you're going to create files, and within the files, you're going to have your own way of finding your data. Or you can directly write to the device. And in that case, uh, you gain a little bit more speed at the expense of more engineering for us. But from the point of view of the user, you don't care, because the, 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 the heavy lifting has to be done only one time, hopefully. <laughs> um, so. 
to go back to um, the architecture in terms of clustering, um, so everything within uh, the database is uh, distributed, uh, and distributed transactions are first citizen in the sense that everything you do can be a transaction and everything can be verified by this transaction. Um, to do the distribution, we are based on an algorithm uh, named Cord. Uh, you can look it up, it's from the MIT. Um, we did a couple of modifications to it. Basically, it's uh, consistent hashing. Uh, consistent hashing meaning that you have uh, sh automatic sharding of the data across your cluster. And um, every node then is responsible for a range of data. Uh, the range of data is computed uh, for a given key, for example, for the name of your time series. It's going to uh, be actually splitted over the cluster. Uh, if your time series, for example, is very large, like there is really a lot of data, obviously you want this data to be cross spread across the whole cluster, right? Because uh, if you have one terabyte of time series and you have four nodes, you ideally want to have 256 gigabytes on the four node. So to do that, we transparently uh, shard the time series across time. And uh, we do our best to have locality of different time series for a given time. Um, again, so as you can see, we do direct access to the block device and the network card on every node, and every node is working independently of every other node. That is, as soon as you've decided that a node is responsible for your data, it doesn't need to communicate with the other node, unless you're doing a distributed transaction, which we're going to see later. So the advantage of, the arch of this architecture, um, we've been working a lot with uh, Cisco for the network and performance and benchmarking, is uh, scale-out really works. Uh, if you have an architecture which is more based on consensus algorithms and that kind of stuff, the problem you can have is when you do updates, you need to wait for the consensus to be finished. And that's not our case because we can just, when you have your shard, you just work on your shard. Is that benchmark? Just, just ingesting? Uh, yeah, so it's really just um, you do use a primitive. So the question was, what's the benchmark? So in this case, you use the native uh, primitive API to write blobs to the database and see if these writes are scaling up. Uh, same for the reads. Mm -hmm. So when you do a time series, it's going to be a little bit different because you are going to have an intermediate processing of uh, serializing a time series, finding what it is. But the goal there was really to uh, see, do we have any bottleneck? Do, can we really scale out? Uh, if not, there is something wrong in the algorithm. Yeah, you had a question? Uh, so you're saying each shard works independently. Uh, is there no redundancy in data, or is it like asynchronous? Okay, so that's a really good question. The question was, every node works independently, but uh, what about application? What about synchronization? So it's true that every node works independently, except for replication, where we are synchronous. Again, let's go back to the requirements, where we need to be very reliable in our updates. So we don't want to accept a data, say, yeah, yeah, we did replication, and then we lose a node, and the replication did not happen, and then the data is lost. So we wait for the replication, meaning in that case, a uh, node is going to elect a node as a replica slave, and so it's really a hybrid peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, master-slave architecture. So for one node, every node is going to have a slave to which is going to do replications. And if the node goes down, automatically the slave is going to be promoted master for this area of node, and it's going to then again start replication. And the replication is configured on the cluster. And that's the work we did with Melanox, so it's very interesting. Uh, so VMI is really a thing around DPDK, and actually I think now they have new stuff, we can uh, even go faster. So that's the gain you get to bypass the operating system, more or less, if you allow me to take shortcuts in explanation. So it's uh, almost uh, three times faster. Just because, and it's exactly doing the same thing, right? It's sending packets on the network, exactly the same packets. There is no, uh, I mean, compromise done in integrity on anything. The only thing that happened is we bypass the kernel and we write directly to the network card. And we used uh, this specific network card for this. So, 
this seems really slow compared to what mm. actually do at a packet rate. Yeah. What's the bottleneck here? Uh, I think it's a uh, VMA. Is this this is just one byte requests? Cause, yeah. I mean that number could be thirty million. Yeah, it could be, but uh, that's a good question. Uh, I have no idea why it's uh, so different. Remember that there's the whole protocol of the database uh, running. It's not just a uh, dump server sending one byte and the answer. So this is requesting at the database level? Yeah. But uh, you're right in the sense that it should be much higher. Uh, and for the time being, we haven't identified clearly where the bottleneck is. Um, this was a Numa machine. I think there may be surprises related to our software and the interaction with the Numa machine. Like, um, is the request I get in the right call when I get it? That kind of stuff. But be very happy if you can help me increase this value. Well, <laughs> just come to talk to me. Um, <laughs> so um, then, OK, that's the database, what we do roughly very quickly in the time I have uh, what, to give you an idea of what the database looks like. Um, I just want to spend some time to give you back some concepts in terms of software engineering uh, very, very quickly because we're going to see what we've done to, uh, for example, we are pretty good at scaling up except on human machines, which is a nightmare for databases. Um, and so I, I spent some time with the low-level uh, coding. So one of the first thing the database has to do is memory management. Uh, and memory management, you can say, well, I'm going to use a garbage collected uh, language and my problem is solved. Uh, not really. Uh, the, the real problem underlying uh, memory management is the lifetime of your, your values in memory, is when can I delete it? And so the garbage collector is going to give you an answer, which is going to be based on different algorithms. Or you can manually, in your code, decide when it's safe to delete a value. Um, just And of course, when you have a multi-threaded application and asynchronous I.O., it's even worse because it's very, very hard when you code to know when it's safe to release memory back to the system. Um, asynchronous I.O., uh, so of course, I think every database today is doing asynchronous I.O. Uh, like we do, so we do asynchronous I.O. for um, network in particular. Um, so it's really about telling to the kernel, well, please uh, do this for me, and when you're done, tell me. If you, uh, if uh, it's high level explanation. Uh, this is very powerful because uh, while the kernel is uh, working and probably waiting for the hardware to receive the packet, for example, from a distant machine, you can actually do stuff because the, the hardware is just waiting. Uh, then about, uh, just to speak about uh, multi-threading and uh, scalability, uh, what's interesting about multi-threading performance is uh, if you want to scale up, that is if you have a multi-core machine and you really want to use all the cores of your machine, uh, it's actually very hard. It's not just a question of, oh, I'm going to add threads. Yeah, but uh, the values you have, uh, at some point you're going to want to have some sort of synchronization, right? Yeah, because um, let's say someone is updating your uh, value in memory, it, a user updates the value in memory, uh, and the value is more than just an integer, it's a whole blob. And you want the update, uh, if someone reads the value, you want at least to either give the old value or the new value, but not half of each, right? So uh, what's interesting to know about multithreading is basically reading is easy to, to, uh, to scale up. Uh, if you just want to share access to the same value, you don't have to do anything special. Uh, the hardware will be very clever about it and just have threads read the data. What it's difficult is when you want to share writing to a value, uh, then that's very hard. And actually, the more threads you have, the worse the performance is going to be. And that's why it's very hard when you design a database, because mm, unless you have a read-only database, which uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what would be the use, uh, you're going to struggle uh, to balance uh, the write loads and the read loads. 
Okay, and so just to go back uh, about uh, memory management, so you can take the decision when you design your database to uh, use a garbage collected uh, language. Uh, that's a decision that has been made by some da database makers. Personally, I think it's outsourcing something which is strategic to a database. Um, you, I've, you know, very often uh, in your course, very often I think your teacher told you, you don't know better than the operating system what you're going to do. You don't know better when the garbage collector what you're going to do. And in most of the case, it's true. But when you do a database, which is um, really a massive piece of software, very often actually you have a better idea of what you should be done than the OS, and you have a better idea of the garbage collector of what should be done. And that's where it could be interesting to see if manual memory management is better. So that's the path we chose, and uh, it added it was more expensive in terms of engineering resources to do, but it really paid off because we don't have um, the problem you have with the, the garbage collector uh, going crazy because it has to collect and though it freezes everything. Although there's a lot of progress being made in that area. Okay, so just. Just, to, just so you know, I'm a C++ guy, right? I wrote a book about C++, so I'm be, maybe a little bit biased, right? Okay, so let's scale up. Why do we, we want to scale up? When I started to do software engineering, uh, the only thing I had to do to have my software uh, go faster is wait for Intel to give me a new processor. And I would take the same processor, the same program exactly the same, and it would just go faster. Um, we call that, it's been called, I think, by Herbstutter, the end of the free lunch. Today, if you really want to leverage the next generation of processor, you have to make sure that your application is able to run on multiple cores, that it is being multi-threaded. Uh, that is, today, if you decide, the database we have is very recent. I mean, it starts from scratch. We had no technical depth. We could just do whatever we want. We started from scratch. And uh, early on, it was pretty clear that we had to be uh, multi-core uh, native, that we had to be multi-threaded, because we could take the decision of being a single-threaded database, but in which case we would probably pay it very dearly in the future. So as I said again, uh, being mono-threaded, it makes everything easier because you don't have to care about contention, locks, and anything. But then you don't benefit from uh, the latest processors and architectures. And yeah, like I said, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually uh, very hard to scale up a software in general. I give you just one question. Do you know what it is? Yeah, you have an ID. So it's, it's really how hard it can get uh, if you don't know about it the first time you learn about it. Um, so you say, I have no mutex in my application. That is, I did not specify any primitive to do locking. And yet you do your benchmark, and you see that you do not scale with the number of threads. And you say, well, what did I do wrong? Well, maybe there is a lock somewhere. Maybe I missed something. And that's because you have to remember how a processor works because obviously when you're doing updates in memory uh, the processor has the architecture has some way to make sure that you don't do stupid things like uh, update the same value at the same time. It has to be consistent as well because if you read back the value, I think if you would 4 in memory, you really want to read back 4. Um, what you need to know is so I have my thread vi writing to first variable, right? And the other thread writing to another variable. And that doesn't scale. And independent variables, no lock, no nothing. And why it doesn't scale? Because in memory, it's going to be on the same cache line. And updates on the same cache line are locked by the processor. That kind of stuff you, you can have. And that forces you to go very deep down in, in, in what you're going and really understand the hardware in terms of performance and what you're doing when you want to scale up. This is, it can be a very bad surprise. So another interesting stuff. Uh, do you know about reference counting? Uh, maybe. So it's a memory management 
a strategy that exists uh, very used in C++. Basically, every time you make the copy of an object, you increase a reference counter. And every time you uh, no longer use it, you decrease the reference counter. And when it reaches zero, it means no one is using it, and you can destroy it safely. Uh, it's heavily used. Uh, and so the name of the structure is named a shared pointer. You can also hear about smart pointers, the same thing. And uh, so to do that, you have an atomic counter that is, again, an atomic value uh, that is going to be uh, verified for the increase because you really don't want to miss uh, an update and you have multiple threads updating the value. Um, what you need to know is that atomic increment and decrement compared to a classic increment or decrement of an integer is 20 to 100 times lower. So if you have, uh, it's really not uh, a lot of objects, like 10,000 objects, what is it? It's nothing. As you can see, uh, the cost of having references uh, is, can become very significant. And again, you can lose your multi-threading capabilities because of it. So the raw pointer is just the regular pointer, nothing fancy, the data in memory. So what is this workload? You're, you're, just, you're just reading the pointer? Or, or like, what do you, what oh, it's a good question. There? So uh, it's a pointer. The question is, what do we do? Do we just read the pointer? So it's pointer intensive manipulations, like uh, I'm just passing the pointer to a function. Just this. I give you the pointer. So it's, in theory, the most inexpensive operation you can do because it's really just reading from a register, right? But when it becomes a smart pointer, it becomes an expensive operation because when I do that, I have to atomically increment the reference counter and maybe decrease it as well later. And because if it's atomic, in terms of uh, multi-threading, it's going to be very, very uh, significant. So you, you have eight threads in that context. So what, is, what I'm not, I don't know the answer. What is the standard library shared pointer doing that, that the boost shared library doesn't do, or it's better? Why is the boost one better? Uh, to be honest, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, and, and especially because I, I don't remember in which compiler we tested this. So maybe you're going to test uh, with another compiler to get a different value. Um, maybe it was because of memory location and cache locality, that kind of stuff. Um, the way you create your uh, smart pointer, you may want to have uh, the counter in the same memory area than the object, that kind of stuff. Uh, it can be also maybe that the compiler saw an optimization opportunity. In, it's, uh, at this amount of data, I would say it's within the same range. Maybe, uh, yeah. So you, your message just to, to the children here, the students, is don't use smart pointers. No, no, uh, no, it's not my message. <laughs> my message is sometimes the bottlenecks can be in trivial things you would miss because the smart pointer is hidden in, uh, for example, a type definition. And what my message would be benchmark your code, audit it and I have no specific idea about where the bottleneck is, and you would be surprised about what can come up in I, I up in, uh, in terms of bottlenecks. So don't be surprised at some point if uh, you see, well, it's point operation, how can it be? Is this something that you guys like, came across? And, like, oh, we're using... No, no, to be honest, we, um, so we have, uh, it's for session objects. A session object is what we use when someone connects. Uh, we use row pointers coming from a pool, but we knew that before doing the benchmark that it's going to be better. Uh, that's, but sometimes it's good to run the experiment to convince yourself that it's worth it. Yeah, question? Do you have any memory leaks because you used route pointers that you had to debug and eliminate that you wouldn't have had had you used the safer slower pointers? Okay, so the question was, uh, did we have any memory leaks because of that? And the answer is, we don't have memory leaks. <laughs> uh, no, no, um, not really because we, uh, the lifetime of the object is the lifetime of the database. It's the session object we pre-allocate at the instantiation and we destroy when the database shuts down. So in that context, there is no way we can leak because uh, it's a fixed amount of objects. Uh, it's something like by default 20,000 concurrent sessions. Uh, otherwise, we do use smart pointers, especially for asynchronous operations. Uh, because, yes, there is a cost, uh, but 
good luck finding when you can destroy an object from an asynchronous operation. Uh, the typical trap is when it doesn't work well. Uh, that your answer is being delayed by the system and uh, you get a new request. But somewhere there's still this old request with your old buffer going on. And you say, well, I have a new request, so it's safe to deallocate the old one, right? And then it crashes. So we really tried, so to answer your question, in some areas we try to get away with short point, smart pointers. I think it's possible in theory, but the cost in, in, in terms of engineering would be very high, and the benefits in performance, it's not like it's going to be tenfold, right? Uh, so yeah, we do use smart pointers a lot, but you just, we're just very careful about how we use them. Yeah, another question? No, no question? Okay, fine. Okay, so I showed you the problems. Uh, let's see about what we can do to find solutions uh, with all these problems. Of course, it's really a subset of everything you have to do to build a database. I'm really talking about the low-level problems of building a database. Then if we were dabbling more into the time series problems, like uh, how can you write an aggregation engine that is as fast as possible? So hint, you do a columnar database and you leverage uh, single instruction, multiple data instructions. Uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and you care about uh, allocations and that kind of efficient memory allocation and other stuff. Do you guys use TC Malloc? Um, so the question is which memory allocator do we use? We currently use the memory allocator from TBB and our own memory pools. Um, we, the benchmark we, we saw is uh, at some points the most performance you can get is being smart about memory allocation. Pre-allocate when you can and do that in a pool. Um, we may want to switch to GE malloc uh, but the reason would be because it has a lot of interesting statistics inside and that's really great and we could uh, show that back to the customer say hey you've done so many allocations maybe you should change your request um, but the TBB allocator um, is satisfactory in terms of uh, performance for us. I, I don't know if I'm like, like cutting what you're talking talk about do you use TDB for other things as well? Like oh, so, okay. The question is, do we use TDB for other things? The answer is yes. We even wrote a white paper with Intel about it. Yeah. Um, so uh, we do love uh, the log-free containers they have. They are very, very nice. Uh, they have also very interesting um, uh, locking primitives. For example, we like that they have speculative mutex using transactional memory. That's pretty cool. Uh, and why would we want to write that? Do you use, like, do you use it for the threading stuff as well? No. So uh, the first version of the database, we're using a, a intensively the scheduler from TB. It's actually a great question. Uh, do we use uh, the TBB scheduler? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, and the first version did. But the performance was very bad. And it's not related, related to TBB. It's not related to us. Uh, it's because uh, it re was creating context switches. So you have this thread, which is the I.O. thread uh, coming from the user, and you do the accept, then you go to the select, and then you have this thread, or you process the query from the user. You deserialize the packet, and then you would push that to TBB, which will be running a different thread, and you lose the locality. And the significant, it's really huge difference in performances. And we are not compute intensive enough to justify the cost of the switching. Um, that may change in the future. I don't know. So a single connection handles, like a single thread handles the connection, yeah. and data ingestion, and whatever yeah. processing you want to do, yeah. commit, yeah. And, then, and then the response. Yeah, exactly. The design is really, uh, basically, the database is sharded by thread. So when you instantiate the database, you decide how many worker threads you're going to have. And a thread has the responsibility of everything from beginning to end. And that really yields very good performance. That approach only works if the processing is short short enough. Uh, if we had much more expensive analytics going on, I think we would need to uh, switch to a different strategy. Uh, that's it. So the basic toolbox is, uh, so we don't do coroutines anymore at all, uh, for various reasons. So coroutine is uh, also named as uh, lightweight threads, or it can be named fibers. 
It's basically when you do yourself the scheduling of uh, the tasks. Uh, we have in the threading, it's the operating system which is going to decide when you're finished and when you're not finished. Uh, coroutines can be very, very, very powerful in the sense that if you have a good idea of uh, <coughs> what you're going to do in the next uh, cycles, you can be smarter than the operating system. Uh, in our case, that's, we didn't find any benefits. But it's a good tool to know that exists. Uh, then data sharding. Um, so, like I said again, uh, you can scale reads very well, but you can't scale writes. But you can cheat by making copies. If you're willing to pay the extra memory, you can just have uh, the data in several threads at the same time, and then they can all do their stuff on the data, and they will not interfere with each other. So that's a way to do it. Um, we did that a lot in the past. Now we do that less and less uh, because um, the memory usage can become uh, very high. Uh, we see techniques also to get around uh, locking and that kind of stuff. A thing I like a lot personally is read-write locks when they're efficiently implemented. Um, if you have read-heavy um, workloads, read and write locks, and in time series it's often the case, it's really I write my time series one time and then I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Uh, we have micro locks everywhere that are using uh, low level excluded uh, locks from TBB and we use that to manage uh, access to the entry in a safe way. And again, like I said, the optimistic spin metaxis using transactional memory uh, and it's uh, available in processors, most processors now. When you say micro lock, you mean like a latch? Or something, something like is it a logical lock or a physical lock on the data structure? Um, okay, so the question is, it's a physical lock or a logical lock. Uh, what we the, we use mainly spin metaxis to access the data structure for read-write, and we use uh, spin metaxis that are not too expensive to acquire when for a read. Um, basically, a mutex can be very expensive to acquire for a write, especially if it's a busy mutex like a spin mutex because you have to spin the CPU to wait for the mutex to be available, right? And when you do that, well, you burn up CPU power, so that can be, and the latency can be very high. Uh, so we use uh, l l mutexes that are inexpensive to acquire when for reads, and for writes, of course, well, if you have to wait for the writer to finish, you have to wait for the writer to finish. But that's why also optimistic spin metrics are very interesting, because using transaction memory, what the, an optimistic spin metrics is doing is basically it does a memory transaction, and if it's successful, it means that no one was acquiring the mutex, because in life, conflicts are not so frequent. That is, you, it's, you're not going to uh, read the same value at the sa exactly the same time very often. Right, so you can do as if, well, I'm not going to acquire the mutex, but uh, I will only acquire it if I had to. That's the principle of transactional memory. And uh, another technique you can use, uh, it's uh, thread local storage. So thread local storage is much slower than registers, but it's not shared, and um, there's a couple of things you can do, uh, it's, uh, yeah, TBB combinable and enable thread specific. It's uh, what we call, uh, I think it's a spread counters. Let's say you want to count the number of, of entries in your database. So the naive approach would be have an atomic counter and every thread is going to increment this counter. But as we saw, it's not going to scale because, well, at some point all the threads are going to try to access the same atomic value, right? And it's not because it's atomic that it's going to be fast. So what you can do is every thread is going to increment a counter in a local thread storage. And only when you want to know uh, the total value, you're going to sum all of them. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Any other question at this time? No? So another way to uh, manage access to a shared object is, uh, so it's hazard pointers. So basically, uh, you create a list of uh, the values you want to access, 
and uh, you use that to know if uh, you can access the value. So you, uh, it's actually, there's a patent, uh, I think, on, uh, on these uh, techniques. Uh, it's what my notes say, however. So be careful of <laughs> about what you use. Um, and this one is more interesting. It's actually uh, it's a good transition because then I, I can speak about uh, multiversion concurrency control. Uh, it's basically, so I can't write to the same value, right? I can't because uh, I will get contention. But what I can do is instead of writing the same value, I will create a new value and write to it. And at some point in time, when I decide that I don't no, no longer need the old value, I can erase it. And it's going to be invisible for the other because they, if, for example, you have a thread that is accessing the old value and doesn't want to see the update yet, it's as if no update ha appeared. And uh, it's interesting because you will find uh, this concept uh, in what's called multiversion concurrency control. Uh, multiversion concurrency <coughs> control is, again, in a database, you always have this problem of how am I going to handle the fact that I'm going to have concurrent updates for the same values. It's, it's the, you can't prevent it. Uh, someone is going to want to write to your value at the same time. And to do that, what you can, one of the ways to lock, right? You can just, okay, wait for the other person to, to finish. And the other way is to do multiversion concurrency control where everyone is going to uh, see a value uh, according to a timestamp in time. And if I am after the value in time, then I will create a new value and I will see the future. That is my new value, but thread running in the past with a timestamp in the past, we see the old values. And the challenge is then when, do I ca when can I remove the old values? It's called trimming. Uh, we use multiversion concurrency control in, in Quasar uh, for distributed transactions. Okay, so uh, now I just just give you uh, in one hour I can't obviously go into details of what we did in several years to make the database fast, but I hope in what I showed you you have an idea that it uh, can be a huge undertaking just to be what we saw is just what you have to think about to scale up in multi-threaded environment. Right? We didn't even write to disk or read from the network card. We haven't even done serialization. We haven't even, uh, how are we going to communicate from client to server? But I hope you can see that there's a lot of thinking to be done if you really want to have a huge level of performance. So one thing I, I'm very, uh, my, it's really something uh, I, I'm very careful about is memory copies and especially the ones you don't see. And it's easy to say, well, it's inexpensive because of the memory bandwidth, yada, yada, yada. But actually, uh, this can be super expensive. And we know for a fact because, so we have this low level key value API we, we give when you use database, you can use it. And we have uh, two APIs just for, to get value. There is one which is, uh, allocates memory for you and put that in a buffer because you don't want to, to do anything about it. And there is one with no copy where you write, we write directly to the buffer uh, that you give us. And when the data becomes large, the difference in performance is really huge. And we're just talking about one copy. Um, so when, it's, uh, when I say huge, it's like 20, 30 percent. So and it's really for like, uh, if you have 50 megabytes or that kind of stuff. Um, so the thing is, when you use libraries and you write in your language, and depends on the language, you can have a lot of hidden copies. And it's not immediately obvious what's going on with your data and memory. So um, the hidden copies you have uh, can be a huge performance bottleneck, and for several reasons. First, it's going to increase the pressure on your allocator. And there's going to be a threshold when you exist a certain number of allocation and deallocation are going to uh, create memory fragmentation. And then the more your database runs and the more you have performance problem. 
Secondly, uh, you are making the life of cash a little bit harder because you're accessing all the time different values. And if you can access the same value all the time, it's really better, not only for the cash, but also for the memory paging system. Um, for example, uh, we, we often forget that the memory we access, we actually go through a system which is called uh, pagination. That is, the memory we use is not actually the physical memory, but a page that represents physical memory. And if you access memory within the same page, it's much faster than accessing memory from different pages. And avoiding copies, that kind of stuff, that really can leverage a lot of performance. Uh, ideally, my dream <laughs> would be able to uh, take the buffer from the network card and write that directly to the disk uh, when I have an update without the processor in between. Um, that would probably require dedicated hardware, but I think it's the future of database. Really write directly to the disk without any processing and don't do any copy. Is there any tool that you found? In, is the, how do you make sure you, you don't have a bunch of extra copies? Is it just coding discipline or is there a tool you find that like so, a pretty good job identifying problems? So it's a, the, the question is how do we find that we don't have copies? So there is, of course, discipline. Uh, what, you, what you see, there is constant benchmarking of what you do. And in C++, you can just uh, prevent copies uh, or catch copy constructors, that kind of stuff. So you know that there's been a copy going on and why. You, you have coding techniques in C++ to say, I prohibit copies of this object. So I know for a fact that it's not going to be copied. Then the thing is that when you use third-party libraries, we always see um, if in the documentation there's a way uh, to uh, not have uh, copies or that kind of stuff. If they provide a memory copy uh, free, um, copyless, or zero copy uh, API. So the zero copy actually comes, uh, this uh, passion <laughs> I have for zero copy comes because I, I was working in file systems. And uh, it's really about uh, having a zero copy cache for the file system. Uh, so bypassing the kernel. So again, that's a bit insane because why would you want to bypass uh, such evoluted uh, piece of software? Why? Why do you? What do you know better than the public system? Right. Um, so for file system, uh, that's actually pretty obvious. Uh, the file system is getting between is between you and the disk, and in a case of a database, uh, while you don't really need the file system, if you have a pretty good idea of the data structure you have, let's say uh, so. In our case, we use a technology coming from a company Lemlevix, which is neither a LSM nor nor a B3. Uh, but let's say if you have a B3 and you want to write it directly to disk, uh, that's more efficient than going through files. And the other advantage of bypassing the file system is you don't have any surprise in terms of caching, write cache, if you want to be sure that the data is actually written to disk, uh, which is a guarantee we have to provide. So in our case, we have a small buffer of one page, which... So, so you're using Levix's stuff on yeah. raw block device? Yeah, so the question is, do we use Levix stuff on raw device? And the answer is yes. We uh, mount directly an NVMe card and write directly to it. But you're still going through the kernel for block rates? Uh, so yes, the question is, do we still go f to the kernel for the block rights? And the answer is yes. Do you wish you could, do you wish, do you believe that it would be worth saving <coughs> that kernel interposition by using something like the SPDK? So the question is, do you think SPDK is interesting? And the answer is maybe yes. <laughs> I know the Levix folks. I'm wondering yeah. if I should suggest to them. I assume you probably also Yeah, yeah, yeah we, though, so, but, well, that's a discussion we can have. For me, every, every intermediary we can suppress is interesting, but maybe we would be surprised by the numbers and that maybe it's not worth it because of uh, the device is actually the bottleneck. Uh, that's, I don't have the answer. I don't know. Uh, for Optane, that's probably interesting. For the NVMe, the fastest NVMe you can get is what? Two gigabytes per second in write. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You can do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you still use the file system for metadata or do you 
So the question is, do we use a file system at all? And the answer is, when we go through the Levix layer, the answer is we don't need a file system. Uh, you can, there are different ways you can use us. You can use, we have a RocksDB uh, persistence layer that you can use, which is going to rely on the file system. The advantage is then you can use RocksDB open source tools if you want and access the data, etc. Or you can use uh, the Levix persistence layer, uh, in which case you can either mount a device or mount a file as a device. Yeah, we the the Livix layer is faster than RocksDB in most cases, and it's not just because they mount the the, the device directly, but it helps. So you, yeah, you you only have five people working on the data system. You've done all these things. <laughs> yes. Okay. The answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> We well, when when you suppress sleep, uh, you gain a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> so just to be fair, the the low level persistence layer we didn't write it right. It's from the Levix guys, um, and again we were I think uh, like, no not one wanted to boast. We've been smart about uh, not writing anything we could not we what, that that would not make sense. For example. Uh, the trap is if you have a big team, you say, well, we're going to write our own locks, we're going to write our own um, lock-free maps, we're going to do that. But if you are resource constrained, that forced us, because we didn't raise money uh, in the first place, so we had nothing, right? And so the, when you are really constrained and you have a customer who wants a product, then you can be very smart and go very fast. You said you had one kilobyte pages, right? When, when you go raw, to the raw storage device, you need more one pages? So, uh, the, the question was, uh, we have one kilobyte pages. No, uh, what I was saying, uh, maybe uh, I was incorrect, is we have a buffer between us and the disk. We are not 100% synchronous, because that would be maybe problematic in terms of performance. And the size of the buffer is one page. Okay. So it's four kilobytes. Um, generally, it's up a micros couple of microseconds of, yeah. It's acceptable. Uh, Trade-offs, right? Um, yeah. So that's one is interesting. Um, if you send a request to a database, uh, whatever request it is, if it's uh, hey, here's my bunch of points uh, that, I, that I want to insert in my time series, what you have to do is to serialize this data and send it to the server, right? And maybe you are running from a Windows XP. Uh, it's real life uh, scenario, right? With 32-bit Windows XP writing to a 64-bit Linux. And you can't just dump the memory on the wire and send it and read it. So you have to do what's called serialization. I think you've heard about it. And we spent a lot of time being very efficient about serialization. Uh, like, it's really something that showed up uh, in when you benchmark the software and you want to see how much time you spend doing requests. And serializing requests is actually using a lot of time. So what we did is, um, let me check the next slide. Oh yeah. So we leveraged uh, C++ template metaprogramming techniques to see if you could decide at compile time the amount of memory you would need uh, to serialize a structure. And I will give you the most simple example. Let's say you want to send a 64-bit um, integer. You know at compile time exactly the amount of memory you need to send that. It's eight bytes, right? Assuming you don't do via dec into in, uh, encoding, and by composition, you can compute the size of the structure at compilation. If the structure is not just a bunch of integer, then you can compute at compile time how much size the size of the structure. So you can use the stack instead of dynamic memory allocation, and that can really, really gives a lot of performance because doing memory allocation is very expensive compared to just moving the stack pointer. And sorry, you're talking about the client driver, I'm running out of time. You're talking about the client driver, you're compiling it to be hard-coded for your protocol. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm talking about the client and also the server. So you want to be go faster? Yeah, we're Yeah? How much more do you have to go? 
Well, it's almost finished. Okay, perfect. Keep going. Okay. Uh, so that's basically what we've done. Is uh, so I'm sorry to uh, punish you with uh, some C++, but uh, basically we have that code that can detect uh, compilation if you're going to need a memory allocation. If not, we're just going to use a buffer in the stack. Uh, then just to finish kind of funny stuff is um, we use uh, for our distributed transaction we need a, a highly accurate uh, timestamps and uh, yeah that's uh, kind of interesting stuff to know between operating system so just to be fair to Microsoft since Windows 8 it's no longer the case uh, but yeah you can be surprised that some system calls this cost 20 nanoseconds so just nothing. Uh, this is more expensive because we have to do some math to get the right time. So just to finish, so like I said, uh, we like to say we the 100x dB. Like when we go to a customer, the gains have to be in this area because otherwise, just use PostgreSQL, just use uh, SQL Server, just use Oracle. Um, and what I want to do is 10,000x. And how I am. Well, I have a couple of ideas, but it's a secret. <laughs> okay, that's it. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have time for one or two questions. Yes? Um, you talked about uh, putting uh, shared access uh, uh, data blocks into something called a hazard pointer list. Sorry, yes, we. Yeah, we don't use them. You don't use them? No, it's just oh. give an example. Yeah, I've heard of the opposite. No, no. So, we, I have uh, so about the hazard pointer list, uh, the real reason why we don't use them is because of the patent. Yeah, I don't think they will work. Yeah, I also don't think, but I'm not willing to bet the company on it. Right. <laughs> One more question? Have you looked at like code generation for queries, like using LVM to allow, you know, turn the query into machine code? So uh, for queries uh, using LLVM, um, for the moment the queries we have are very simple, very time series related. As we go, I think we will have to be more and more smart, uh, smarter and smarter about it. All right, let's thank Edward again. Thank you.